Hi, everybody, and welcome to Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments, where we invite leaders from our investment team to offer their analysis of the investment landscape and the economic outlook. I'm Jay Diamond, Head of Thought Leadership for Guggenheim Investments, and I'll be hosting today. We are recording this episode on February 16th, 2022. We will be looking at several issues today. First, on the macro front, January CPI data were released last week showing that inflation continues to march higher. Needless to say, when the data came out, the market reacted swiftly to recalibrate what this might mean for economic growth and future Fed policy response. At the same time, central banks around the world are confronting similar issues in their home countries, with one notable exception. Second, Russia and Ukraine may or may not be at war by the time this podcast airs, so market participants are also discounting this exogenous force into their expectations. Third, with this macro and geopolitical backdrop, investors are managing through changing supply and demand technicals and analyzing relative value and evolving risks, including credit risk. With us to provide their latest views on these and other subjects are Paul Dozier, a director in our Macroeconomic and Investment Research Group, and Justin Takata, Managing Director and Head of our Investment Grade Corporate Credit Sector Team. To kick things off, we have Paul Dozier. Paul, take it away. Thanks, Jay. Economic data were relatively light last week, but the data we did get packed a punch. Last Thursday, inflation data for January came in higher than expected, with headline CPI printing at 7.5% while core CPI came in at 6.0%, both reaching their highest level since 1982. Details of the releases didn't offer much relief either, with inflationary pressure showing up beyond just typically volatile and pandemic-related subcategories. Airfares were up, while hotel prices were down. New vehicle prices were flat, while used car price inflation moderated. Apparel and medical goods both increased by about 1% month over month, But given their typical volatility, we could see those categories soften going forward. But we also saw inflation accelerate in categories that have more staying power. As expected, housing rental costs and owner's equivalent rent both accelerated to about half a percent month over month. We expect similar contributions from those for the next several months. The acceleration of inflation within services-related subcategories will also likely be durable given wage pressures within the services sector. Shortly following the CPI print, St. Louis Federal Reserve President Bullard remarked that he would support 100 basis points of Fed rate hikes by July and was open to a 50 basis points move in March and or a hike between regularly scheduled FOMC meetings. The inflation data and Bullard's comments were enough to set off a new round of repricing in market implied expectations for Fed rate hikes. On Wednesday, market implied rate hikes this year totaled 113 basis points, By by the end of the next day, 150 basis points, or six 25 basis point hikes, had been priced. Several Fed watchers changed their call from a 25 basis points rate hike in March to 50 basis points, and an intermeeting hike prior to the March 16 FOMC meeting started being priced in meaningfully. We continue to believe the Fed will be somewhat cautious in removing accommodation, opting for just four 25 basis points rate hikes throughout the year, More measured comments from other Fed officials and geopolitical developments appear to strengthen the case for caution. That said, risk is to the upside in terms of rate hikes, and we'll be watching data and Fed commentary closely. In terms of geopolitical developments, tensions surrounding Russia's military buildup on its border with Ukraine continue to mount. We've marked February 20th on our calendars as a crucial date in this ordeal. That's the last day of the Olympics. Russia held off on attacking the Donbass and Crimea regions in Ukraine until after the Sochi Olympics in 2014. And Russia would presumably not want to erode its support from China, which is hosting these Olympics. February 20th is also the last scheduled date of joint military exercises between Russia and Belarus, which have served as the, as the pretext for the military buildup. However, on Friday, the Biden administration announced that it had intelligence indicating that an invasion could come sooner possibly sometime this week. The news triggered a a sell-off in risky assets and rallies in U.S. Treasuries and the U.S. dollar. In other economic developments, the preliminary February release of the University of Michigan sentiment survey saw a significant downside miss relative to expectations, 
with the headline series printing at its lowest level since November 2011. Survey respondents largely attributed rising inflation and poor purchasing conditions for their dim outlook. Inflation concerns also weighed on NFIB small business optimism, with a majority of respondents indicating that they were ra uh, raising prices to help offset the cost of higher wages. In overseas data, UK preliminary fourth quarter GDP printed slightly higher than expectations at 6.5% year over year. The economy was buoyed by strong net exports and consumption, although ex other sectors also fared well. We expect to see growth come down during the first quarter as a result of Omicron in January, and as the economy converges toward potential growth, which is around 1.5%. And Chinese M2 money supply growth picked up during January, buoyed by bank loans and total social financing, which indicates that policy accommodation from the People's Bank of China is starting to take effect. The PBOC's easing monetary policy stands in stark contrast to the removal of accommodation taking place almost everywhere else globally. And that's all I've got. Back to you, Jay. Thanks, Paul Dozier. Next, we have head of investment grade corporate credit, Justin Takata. Justin, the microphone is yours. Hey, thanks, Jay. Uh, yeah, you know, February has been a, a pretty weak and volatile month thus far for investment grade corporate spreads. And I think that's evident in the total return performance of IG corporates really down around 5% year to date. And, you know, that weakness has really been exacerbated by a, uh, um, an increase in geopolitical risks, whether we're talking about Ukraine and Russia as of late or uh, global tensions around the Olympics. Uh, or even the protests surrounding COVID vaccines in Canada. And furthermore, I, I think the headline risks for Fed commentary and policy uh, has, has really increased as well, uh, significantly, in fact. And I think data dependency is more relevant than it has been. And I think the market has really become hyper-focused on um, each an individual economic release, whether it's CPI, uh, wage growth, GDP, et cetera. Um, you know, I think we could really see further outflows uh, from the total return oriented uh, investors um, as, as the performance is down year to date materially. And we still have these negative, um, I think, uh, volatile headline risk uh, situations ahead of us. Now, but all that being said, I think we should lose sight that there are some positives for IG corporate spreads. And I think you look at those on a technical and fundamental basis. From the technical side, uh, typically uh, February is a, is a lighter month for investment grade supply. Um, and that's it's more seasonal in, in that sense. However, I think what's gone on this month particularly to make it um, an underwhelming 34 billion versus 90 billion expectation was really this volatility that we've seen where issuers step back in from the market. So you're combining a seasonally softer light period for issuance along with some volatility and you really get, um, you know, gross supply down. But really what it means is we're likely going to have negative net issuance for the month. Um, and that can be a positive uh, for for spreads is there's not that secondary sell pressure uh, that we see from, from uh, anybody trying to raise cash to participate in the primary market. Um, I think it's also important to note that you know, year to date, 60% of the trading days uh, resulted in net buyers from the investor base uh, community. So they're buying dips even as we're seeing uh, widening. And I think that's, that speaks to a good support uh, from, the, from the investor base um, for spreads. You've also seen trading volumes increase above average for this time of year. Um, and I think that is a positive as well uh, because it's pointing to the fact that there's real healthy risk transfer that's going on. Typically in a weaker environment, you see um, volumes drop and there's not as much uh, price verification or data points around pricing. And that's what causes further weakness. But we're seeing some support here when we, uh, when we see dips or, or spreads widen. Uh, also, foreign demand continues to be strong. We've had, you know, uh, Asia come back from uh, a Lunar New Year and uh, be very active, more so in long duration. But also when you take a step back and you look at the hedge yield pickup that uh, between whether you're European or a, 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 an Asian investor, 
that uh, hedge, that FX hedge yield um, on a historical basis is still quite attractive. Um, recent hawkish statements by the BOE and the ECB have compressed that a little bit, but again, on a historical basis, still attractive and seeing the sponsorship through investment grade corporates. Um, you know, finally, on the fundamental side, uh, growth continues to be a, a very strong um, support mechanism here for credit. Uh, you've got 4Q21 earnings tracking around 30% year over year growth. And that growth and those strong fundamentals really is going to support uh, triple B spreads more so than single A spreads. Um, triple Bs, by their very nature, uh, benefit more by fun from fundamentals uh, because you're worried more about credit risk as a triple B investor. Um, and with those strong uh, growth earnings and fundamentals, um, I, I think it's brought in a decent buyer base there and caused them to really outperform single A's year to date. Um, as single A's are a little bit, uh, fall a little bit more victim to rate moves like we've seen and they're slightly longer duration uh, and they get thrown in the mix for, for uh, being a little bit more aggressive on M&A, both in size and, um, and scale. Um, you know, and so I think when you take a step back, you know, investor sentiment remains highly uncertain, but with steady bond buying, but also a cautious dealer positioning, um, you know, coupled with elevated levels of implied volatility and significant ETF hedging. So I really think you should look for the market to be more defensive um, and, you know, they're going to sell rallies, but also buy dips. And really what I think that results in is, uh, one, an orderly market, but two, uh, probably puts a cap on material spread tightening um, going forward in the, near, in the near term. So the path of least resistance for me is likely spreads a little wider with some, uh, some uh, relief rallies, but those likely, uh, likely are sold. Finally, you know, what looks attractive um, in, this, in this environment, I think uh, two things to highlight really are uh, preferreds have started to look um, uh, more attractive, and I think it's, it's time to take a harder look at those subpar, um, subpar trading securities within preferreds. And I think we need to be very cognizant of the structure in which we invest in um, that's taking both into account the increase in rates, but also potential spread credit spread widening in the future. And, um, and also, if you have to buy duration, I prefer 20-year bonds versus 30-year bonds, uh, given the, the curve dynamics uh, that with flattening and the 20-year inverted with a 30-year, subpar bonds is prudent defensive positioning against further rate moves higher. That's all I have. Back to you, Jay. Thanks, Justin. One clarifying note for our listeners, when Justin says subpar bonds, he means bonds that are trading below par. My thanks once again to Justin Takata and Paul Dozier. And thanks to all of you who joined us for our new podcast. I'm Jay Diamond, and we look forward to gathering again for the next episode of Macro Markets with Guggenheim Investments. In the meantime, for more of our thought leadership and videos, including the CIO Outlook by Scott Minard, our global CIO, visit GuggenheimInvestments.com slash perspectives. So long. Important notices and disclosures. Investing involves risk, including the possible loss of principal. This podcast is distributed or presented for informational or educational purposes only and should not be considered a recommendation of any particular security, strategy or investment product, or as investing advice of any kind. This material is not provided in a fiduciary capacity, may not be relied upon for or in connection with the making of investment decisions, and does not constitute a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. The content contained herein is not intended to be and should not be construed as legal or tax advice and or a legal opinion. Always consult a financial tax and or legal professional regarding your specific situation. And herein are subject to change without notice. Forward-looking statements, estimates and certain information contained herein are based upon proprietary and non-proprietary research and other sources. Information contained herein has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but are not assured as to accuracy. 
No part of this material may be reproduced or referred to in any form without express written permission of Guggenheim Partners LLC. There is neither representation nor warranty as to the current accuracy of nor liability for decisions based on such information. Past performance is not indicative of future results.